I'm gonna try to bump fire it, but I honestly don't think I can do it. Never tried it before. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna have to do things a little bit differently than I normally do. I'm gonna have to push forward back here with the stock with my supporting hand and see if I can get this to work. Dude, it's not even close. There's there's no movement. It, it's unbelievable. It, it, there's there's no movement. It won't reset the trigger. There's no way I can do this one. We found a gun. I can't bump fire. Dang it! Now I'm gonna be out here all like next two weeks trying to learn how to bump fire this thing. But oh well, I gave it the old college try. Hey guys, welcome back. So today we want to talk about semi-automatic belt-fed firearms and their utility. I featured semi-automatic belt feds on the channel many times before, and in the comments, I've seen people talk about whether or not they're actually useful. Do they serve a purpose other than just being range toys? And that's what we want to talk about in today's video. But before we get started with the video, guys, if you enjoy the content that we produce, please take a moment to like, share, and subscribe to the channel, and also click that little notification bell. It helps us out tremendously. Also, comment down below. We enjoy reading those comments. It also helps us out with the algorithms. With that being said, let's get started with today's video and talk about some belt-fed semi-automatics and some alternatives. Before we take a look at the M249 saw para that I have here, I want to thank our friends over at Primary Arms for helping to make today's video possible. If you guys aren't familiar with PrimaryArms.com, please check them out. They have a great selection of everything from firearms, optics, to bipods, and any type of accessory you can think of. They generally have amazing pricing, fast shipping, and outstanding customer support. We're very happy to be working with PrimaryArms.com, so again, please might check them out. So, this is the M249 Para, and this gun is a factory gun that was produced by FN here in the United States, and they only did a run of them for a short period of time. Uh, this is several years ago. They're no longer in production. They even teased us with a uh, M240 Bravo, but they never brought that to the market. These guns immediately became popular, and that's because people want to own a saw, and owning a fully automatic saw requires a post sample letter and being an FFL SOT and all these things the average gun owner just can't do. It's not practical thanks to the 86 machine gun ban and President Reagan and the NRA. So we're stuck with semi-automatic versions if we want to enjoy these firearms at all. This gun has been pretty reliable, but that's not to say that all semi-automatic conversions of firearms like this are reliable. I've played with plenty of guns that were manufactured by, you know, companies not very well known from parts kits that generally didn't work very well. And then you had other companies like Markomar that created the PKM that we showed you at the beginning of the video. And that gun runs extremely well. And we'll talk about that and why it runs well uh, here in a few minutes. But this gun, like most other belt feds, is originally designed to fire from the open bolt. That means when you pull the charging handle to the rear, you bring the entire bolt to the rear. A sear holds the bolt to the rear. And then when you pull the trigger, the whole bolt assembly goes home, strips around from the belt, and fires the gun. To make them semi-automatic, because the ATF around 1984, don't hold me to that date, but it was right around 1984, the ATF decided arbitrarily that open bolt semi-automatics were no longer legal. And that's when open bolt Mac 10s and things like that went away. This being an open bolt semi-auto would be even cooler if it were possible. But thanks to the ATF yet again, making arbitrary rules up out of thin air, gun manufacturers have to find a way to make them fire from the closed bolt. And that really has an impact on reliability, at least in my experience. Let's take a look inside the saw here and I'll try to show you what I'm talking about. I'm not going to go over the mechanics of the, the saw or any of the firearms out here today. Uh, we've talked about these in previous videos. But right here is your striker assembly. As I pull the bolt to the rear, you can see the bolt. Here's your actual bolt. Now, on a full auto gun, the gun would sit in this position. And then when you pull the trigger, it would slam home and fire around. In the semi-automatic, it leaves the striker to the rear. 
this entire mechanism back here with the extra springs and things like that are not part of the original design. So when I pull the trigger and fire the gun, the striker goes home, fires the cartridge, starts the cycling process. Now the saw <clears throat> is fortunate in that it has a large receiver and there's enough room back here to accommodate the semi-automatic conversion. That isn't always true. It's been quite challenging for companies like DS Arms to make a reliable conversion out of things like the RPD. And DS Arms, to their credit, got it pretty good. I mean, I've shot several of their guns. Some of the early guns had issues, but over time, it seems like they worked the kinks out, but sadly, they're no longer in production. But I digress. So that's the key to most of these semi-automatic belt feds is that they have a striker assembly and all the extra components to go along with it that make it semi-automatic that is out of the norm, not the original design specs, and therefore can cause reliability issues. Let's load the gun up and show you the gun shooting here really quick. The saw fires 5.56 ammunition. You just lay the ammunition in the tray, in the feed tray here. Close your top cover. <clears throat> Grab the charging handle, pull it to the rear, and let it go. Don't ease it home. And then the gun will be ready to fire. It has a cross block safety on it, it is on fire. So it has a long, fairly light trigger. That's about as fast as I can fire it semi-automatic. Open it up, clear out your links, check to make sure that the weapon is empty, and put it back on safe. So it uses the same links as the standard fully automatic version. It uses accessories. This is not the original stock that it came with. It came with the early Para stock. I found this stock online and uh, I was able to put the updated stock on it, which I prefer over the original paratrooper stock. And so it'll accept, you know, the accessories that were available for the guns and stuff like that. And this is an example of a reliable one. This gun has something on it you're not gonna see on a regular PKM, and it's this bar right here through the opening of the stock. On a standard full auto gun, this would be open and this bar would not be here. Why is that there? Well, the striker spring rides in this bar. They could have tried to cram everything into the receiver, they probably did in early prototypes, but discovered the gun was less reliable than this configuration. So this is an example of how they've modified a gun in a way to try to increase reliability of the semi-automatic, and this gun is extremely reliable. It's, it's gonna pretty much eat anything you put into it, and that I attribute to how they dealt with the striker assembly and giving it a full power spring so it would have reliable ignition. Let's talk about the pros and cons of using a firearm like this. Now, first of all, obviously the biggest positive that they have is relatively unlimited ammunition. As long as you have belts, you can just keep linking them together and constantly feed the guns. Now this is a non-disintegrating com block type belt. That means as the gun fires the ammo, the belt continues to fall out the other side of the gun until it's finally out of ammo, then the, the entire belt will just drop out of the gun, right? So it stays together. The belt does not disintegrate. When you take a look at the M249 that uses the M27 links, which is a military standard here in the United States and within NATO, these are disintegrating links. So when you fire the gun, the spent cases and the individual links break apart and both are ejected out the side of the gun. They don't stay together like they do on the com block links. And in this case, you're truly only limited by the number of links that you have because you can link up a 10,000 round belt if you have enough links on hand. So 
that's one of the pros to a belt fed. The biggest problem I have with these is that they're semi-automatic and our second amendment says shall not be infringed. And it was a gross infringement to take these away from us as they were originally designed and that was open bolt machine guns. So, um, you know, I can't really say that's a pro, that's a con. We, uh, you know, it's just, it's just aggravating. It's something that grinds my gears nonstop. So let's get into the cons of the guns. So one of the first things you're gonna find, depending on what you pick up, again, these are no longer in production. And as time goes on, they only get more expensive. Now that's the case with the RPDs and the parts kits seem to have dried up. So um, that's one of the downsides. You're not gonna find a new firearm out there. You're gonna have to buy something that's already used. Now, you're going to have reliability issues with some of the guns, especially if you don't buy a gun that's manufactured by a big name like FN. There is no real standard in links unless you're talking about NATO weapons. So NATO weapons, you know, well, these are going to be much easier to find in the United States links than com block links because these can be shut off for import. What's out there is out there. Uh, they're, you know, even the RPD isn't no longer in use in the, you know, com block uh, states for the most part, the or former com block states, but they're still in use in various war zones, but getting links for this in the United States can be very difficult. So sourcing links can become a bit of a problem. Then you have the whole issue of accuracy. Probably the most accurate belt fed I've ever fired, believe it or not, is the PKM. That thing is insanely accurate with iron sights. I've been able to shoot targets out to 300 yards and hit them with iron sights, so it's pretty funny. Fairly accurate firearm. The M249 saw, we did a, a video, I believe, where we talked about the accuracy of the gun. Um, you know, it's, it's just okay. It's meant to spray lead at a target. It's not meant to really engage a point target. It's meant to be used for suppressive fire, which you're limited by with a semi-automatic. And so... Yeah, you have that poor accuracy to contend with. And then you have heavy triggers. So if you go back and watch some of my old videos where we're doing a thousand round tests on, on handguns, there's two videos out there where I fire 1,000 rounds in 14 minutes. That wore my hand out, my trigger finger out. It's really hard to do. You might not think that it is, but to fire a thousand rounds with, through one of these it would be very, very difficult. It might be even difficult for some of you to fire 500 rounds through these because the triggers are so long and heavy, you're just gonna run out of steam, your, your fast cadence is gonna slow, but you can still fire slowly or as fast as your uh, you know, if trigger finger can work. You can also switch over to the other hand and start using that trigger finger and wear it out. But generally speaking, these things become tiresome to shoot and fairly quickly on some of them. I mean, uh, shooting the PKM will wear you out really quick, your trigger finger really, really quick. And then finally, spare parts. It's really gonna be hard to find spare parts for any of these guns. Uh, you may still be able to find some parts kits out there and you may be able to find bits and pieces of parts out there, but the conversions on many of these guns are unique to the guns themselves. Take the DS Arms RPD here, for example. It's striker fire mechanism, it's semi-auto conversion is different than other conversions that have been done by other people. So finding parts that are unique to that conversion can be difficult. So replacing broken parts, and they do break parts, can become problematic. So it's probably not a good idea to pick one of these up and just run the snot out of them because there's a good chance that you can break the gun. So those are kind of the pros and cons as I see them. If you guys have other thoughts out there, either pro or con, please comment down below. I look forward to reading those comments because I'm sure I've overlooked something uh, in trying to break that down for you guys. So again, comment down below. I'll check those comments out and try to respond to them and look forward to what you guys have to say. One of the things I get asked all the time is, Mac, how can I get involved in the firearms industry? Well, one of the best ways to do that is to consider going to Modern Gun School. It's an accredited school and they offer all the modern classes that will get you up to speed and be able to empower you to go out and find a job in the gun industry. You can learn gunsmithing and things like that, and you learn from home. So please check them out. I have a URL down in the video description below. I wanna thank our friends over at Federal for supplying the ammunition for today's video. The 5.56 that we're consuming was donated by Federal to us to use to make videos like this one, and we love Federal ammunition. Been using them since I was a kid, and we really love working with Federal ammunition. So one thing I wanted to talk about with regards to the saw before we set it aside and have a separate conversation. The saw has one benefit that things like the RPD 
doesn't have, and that's the ability to use standard Stenag magazines. So if you run out of links, you can take magazines that you're either using yourself or people in your team, if you will, have them, and you can insert them into the saw. And I'll show you here really quick. And it'll feed from standard magazines. You can also put drums and things like that in there if you want to. Uh, the saw isn't known for its reliability with these. Uh, in, in the early days, they would shave feed lips off, but in general, uh, this, this gun's run just fine with magazines. This thing is a hoss, and most belt feds are gonna be relatively heavy, but for a 5.56, there really is just too much weight going on here for it to be really practical, especially as a semi-automatic. So let's set it aside and talk about some alternatives. The United States Marine Corps did something and they went kind of back in time to pull the concept out to re, you know, give new birth to it, if you will. And the IAR is a gun that was developed by you know, various companies and submitted to the Marine Corps to replace the 249 saw because it was too heavy and cumbersome. The Marines wanted something lighter, handier, and they could just use standard infantry magazines that all soldiers or Marines would be carrying with them. And this is not a new concept. If you go back to World War I, when machine guns really changed the face of warfare, the guns back then primarily were tripod mounted. Some of them had water cooling jackets around them. The guns weighed a lot and would take, they're truly crew served weapons, meaning it would take at least two men to move them, carry them, operate them. And that's when John Moses Browning came up with the BAR or the Browning Automatic Rifle. And it was a rifle that was lighter than a gun, say like the 1919, certainly lighter than guns that would use water-cooled jackets, could be carried by one soldier and used as a rifle, although it was heavy for its time. It's not a light weapon, but one soldier could easily use the weapon. And that weapon served us through, you know, World War I, World War II, Korea. And, um, you know, it, it probably you can find it on battlefields out there somewhere still today. But that concept of using the same infantry caliber as the soldier's infantry rifle in a firearm that one soldier can carry and use as a lightweight machine gun was reborn with the M27 or the IAR. And this is one of the Colt's prototypes. We've talked about this gun here on the channel before, but if you wanted to build something like this, all that's required is just find a heavy barrel, screw it into your upper receiver, and you can make your own IAR, if you will. Uh, it, it's something that you can do yourself. Parts are fairly readily available, starting to come back to being readily available after our whole pandemic thing. But uh, yeah, so you could build something similar to this. Now, this ultimately was not adopted by the Marines. They went with the HK solution, which basically just had a heavy barrel, didn't have this heat mitigation system down here that this Colt prototype has, but these, these uppers, and that's all this is, is an upper pin to a standard Colt lower, have popped up on places like Classic Firearms, and they, they were actually fairly affordable. I think they're like $1,200 or something like that, and you could pick them up. So they'll pop up every once in a while, and now that Colt's owned by CZ, who knows, maybe they'll go back into production with these if they're popular enough. But so that gives you a gun that is easily portable, uses standard magazines that everybody around you is going to have, lightweight, and this thing is capable of aimed fire. It's an accurate rifle. It's probably uh, as accurate, if not maybe more so, than many of the M4s I've shot. So it's kind of a jack of all trades. And the Russians themselves dumped the RPD. It wasn't reliable enough for them. The soldiers generally didn't like them. They kept the PKM as a heavy machine gun, but for their light machine guns, they went to the RPK, which is similar in concept to the Marine Corps IAR system. So that's really interesting. And going forward, I would say that semi-automatic belt feds are great for collections, great for range toys, but they really don't have that much practical application because of weight, parts, um, things like that. They're, they're just not really practical weapons for anything other than fun. If you need something for more serious use, look at to something like this or something that you can make yourself or just pick up an RPK. Those are still pretty commonly available, still being imported, and there's parts kits builds still being produced out there in the United States. So in the end, I really don't see the value in belt-fed semi-automatics. They're 
cost prohibitive in most cases. Now, probably your best option out there right now, it's a current production, is the Fight Light, which is the MCR. And that's something you can drop onto an AR-15 lower, and it's a dual feed from a magazine like the saw or from a belt. Uh, those uppers are going to cost you five, six thousand dollars. Still cost prohibitive, but they're lightweight, and we've featured them here before on the channel. That's probably your only real option if you want to go with the belt fed. Uh, these things have become ridiculously expensive and are true collector's pieces. Also, I think instead of doing something like this, you're far better off building your own. IAR, if you will, using a heavy barrel on an AR-15, or just pick up an RPK. They're still widely available and still fairly affordable. So in the end, the belt feds are pretty much fun range toys. Uh, they're nice collector's pieces, things like that. But in a practical sense, I take the IAR or the RPK over one of these. All right, guys, I look forward to the comments down below. If you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, the best way to do that is to become part of our Patreon family. Follow the link down below. You'll get early access to videos like this. You'll have direct access to me. I answer all private communications, and we've built a really cool online community over there, so please check it out. Again, the link is in the video description below. Also, right here on YouTube, got a little join button underneath the video player you're watching right now. Click that little join button and consider supporting us here on YouTube. And last but not least, guys, please swing by and check out coppercustom.com. Thank you for 13 years of support. We'll talk to you guys soon.